Ok. Hi everybody. My name is Tev. Uh, and I'm here to speak about JavaScript today. And the essentials. Okay, it's uh, just starting your journey with JavaScript. Um, you'll see that there's a lot of stuff, a lot of code, a lot of applications you can build with JavaScript. And I want to take you on a journey so that you understand what are the components, the key components, and you feel comfortable running, creating your own JavaScript apps. Where to start from? And that's the goal of today. In 45 minutes. And I will do a lot of demos so that you can put your head on what you can build with JavaScript. Um, then my name is Tev. Uh, I'm running a worldwide team of developer advocates. What we do is create learning resources at developer.cisco.com. Then all the learning labs or us and the sandboxes. And then we also do conferences and trainings. Okay, that's, that's our team for IoT, cloud, collaboration, every apps you can build on top of Cisco APIs. Uh, I'm a crazy fan of APIs, and then if you want to speak about APIs, just come to me anytime. I love those. And uh, I do a lot of code samples just because it helps me understand. My code samples are very simple. I will show them today. I don't try to use too advanced syntax. I try to make things very simple so that everybody can understand it, even me. Yeah. I started JavaScript three years ago. Okay, then I'm just, I was new on the journey, and I'm going to, to tell you everything I learned on the way. I had much more of a Java and .NET background. I'm based in France, then this is Europe, and I'm the point of contact for Europe too. Then if you have any question in Europe and you want to do anything with Cisco DevNet, just reach to me. Uh, you've got my, uh, my email there. And then today we'll speak about why JavaScript first. Second, we will see what we can do on the server side and then we'll go to the client side. Easy. And then we should have covered everything. Most of it. Uh, there is a team space for this session. We don't need to use it because we don't have hands ons I don't need to share anything. But what I will do at the end of the presentation, I will put the presentation inside the team space if you want it. And then tomorrow, I will put back my presentation to the speaker office. Then you will get them. OK? But just in case you want to join later. And through this space, you can also ask questions if you need after the talk. Then, what's JavaScript? Why are we speaking about JavaScript? It was created a long time ago. Do you remember 1995? I was there and I was like Netscape Navigator. This version was just now having dynamic pages. I say, wow, what is that? That's useless. All I want is HTML. I don't need anything dynamic in there. Over the time, it grew, uh, but it was built in 10 days. If you think of it, it's a very simple language. Very simple. And very extensible. That can make it tricky to understand. OK, but very simple language with a then simple and a large ecosystem. It means there's, there's lots of flavors, lots of different ways to use JavaScript. Then you will find people using JavaScript to switch on lights, to embed on mobile devices, some to customize room kits. I will show you some of these demos. You can find JavaScript everywhere because it's a universal and very simple language. And then you add some libraries to it, and you make it richer and richer and richer. And you can run it on a server. And some very powerful infrastructures, they work JavaScript at the, at the back end. Okay? Very performant. Not as much as Go or C++ or C, but very good performance because everybody has been working very hard on the interpreter, what runs the runtime of JavaScript. And then I said JavaScript is everywhere. You can find it to build web applications, but also desktop applications and mobile apps. You can find it to build APIs and proxies to root calls, like you do in Python. And you can use it to create a command line interface. Okay? And you can also use it a lot to extend products. If you have a product, you can add a JavaScript runtime to it, so that if someone, an ecosystem needs to add some code to it, it's extensible. Then that's pretty handy. Most of the components that run JavaScript are open source, which means that it's very easy to take. Then let's start with server-side JavaScript. What can we do on the server? 
the key word you need to understand on the server is node. Node is the runtime that runs your JavaScript code. And once, if you've got node on your machine, on the server, in the cloud, wherever you have, if you have a node instance, you can run JavaScript from the command line. Node, space, name of your script, you're running JavaScript now. This one is the node <coughs> runtime is built on V8. It's a code name. Forget about this one. But it's interesting to know that it's the same runtime that runs on Chrome. Then now when you run a web application with JavaScript inside, the JavaScript runtime on the client is the same as what you can run on the server. That's interesting, as powerful. And this is the reason why people love JavaScript, because if you learn it, you can use it server side, client side with a lot of capabilities. And that may be the reason why, if you think of it, if you're very much on the server, you can be good enough with Python. And honestly, you can do Python all your life. And you can do Go. Okay, there are several languages very well tailored for the server. One day, you may want to go to the client side. And then you will need to do JavaScript. But you'll be able to do JavaScript speaking to Python or to Go. Okay? As long as, because your applications are speaking together, then it's fine to mix code. Once you've learned JavaScript, maybe you will want to come back to the server and to do JavaScript on both ends. Because it gets easier. It's only one language. I would say just pick the one that is the best for you. Generally, I start from a code sample. If I find a code sample that works for me, I run that code sample. If it's in Python, I do it in Python. If it's in JavaScript, I do it in JavaScript. Over time, you get more skills. And now, after three years of doing a lot of JavaScript, I feel more comfortable with JavaScript. Then I would do it on the client and on the server. For you, you may take a different direction. If you're new to JavaScript, the easiest way to start is certainly the server. You will see, you run Node, and then you can straight away create a short script, and it will run on your machine. The client side is much harder. I will just spend 10 minutes on that part. Let's focus on the server side from now. Is it OK so far? Any questions? Good. Node is asynchronous. We will speak about that later. Okay, there's a bit of complexity in that last sentence, but let's start with the basics first. You may not need that part. We'll see. Then you go to Node.js.org. Uh, you download your runtime for Windows, for Mac, for Linux. It's running everywhere, OK? Then you pick your version, you install it. And the, the long-term LTS means long-term support. It's a, it's a stable version of Node. Pick that one. This one is just like the latest one, OK? Every six months, they kill this one, and they turn it back to the stable one. Um, then, what do you have in JavaScript? I said the language is very advanced. You've got most of the stuff you would find in any other language. This. Then here, I'm on the website. Then, this is a string. You can put it one of those or two. It's exactly the same. It means exactly the same thing. Then, pick the one you like best. Personally, I keep mixing them <laughs> because I have no preferred one. If you want to go to only one, pick this one. Uh, second thing, we have numbers, of course. Then you can create uh, that I have connectivity here. Yes, we have connectivity. Almost. We used to have connectivity. OK, numbers. OK, the network is so slow, I'm going to continue with some code I have locally on my machine. Then, we have functions, arrays, everything you find in all languages. And the syntax is pretty simple. Then here is an example of how you create an object. This is an ob an, a variable, var. It's a name. And inside, I can put properties. 
then a course has a name and a value. And then I will be able to call, to call course.name to get that value. And you can put as many as you want, different types. Then that, that's objects. Easy so far. Variables, objects, everything you find in any language. There's a lot of tutorials on the internet. Then I would suggest to go to Node School. It's a great meetup, and you'll get the slides, don't worry, but you can also take pictures. <laughs> uh, Node School, it's a community. They, have cre they wanted to, to evangelize Node, and then they also have PowerPoints, sessions, and you can run your own meetup. Or you can join a Node School meetup. All those are exercises you can do end-to-end. -end. There's a lot. JavaScripting is a starting point, but you'll see a lot of those, a lot of exercises. When you will to run the, 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 the examples, you will do a, see here, an NPM install. Then this is an interesting thing about Node, is that I said the JavaScript language is very small. And then, how do you add some libraries to it? Typically, you could, you could drop them. You could add them manually. What we use in the Node community is a package manager. So that if you call global, uh, if you call JavaScripting, oops, sorry. Can you still hear me? Can you still hear me well? If you call JavaScripting from NPM, the Node package manager, it will go on the internet, get that package, the latest version, and bring it back to your computer and install it. Then every time you're typing npm and the name of a package, you're installing, you're installing it locally on your machine. And it comes in a, when you say global, it will be accessible from everywhere on your machine. Which means that now, I can go to my command line, and I'm on Windows. And now I should be able to type uh, JavaScripting. And see, it's starting. And I have installed globally a module. And this one is executable. It's a command line interface. And I will take my first courses. Then variables, strings, again. Then NPM, Node Package Manager. Every time you type NPM, you install something on your machine, whether it's a library or something executable. Pretty easy. Millions of modules you find over there. You will c can create your own. It's free. It's a repository of everybody creating. Then you can create your own tomorrow. And there's a course for that on Node School. Um, then, the next thing you want to do, certainly now you have Node on your machine, you have uh, the npm command comes with Node. When you install Node, you get npm on the command line. Then, don't need to install it um, distinctly, separately. Then, what else do you need? To write code, you want to have an IDE. It's somewhere where you can edit your code and you can have syntax completion. And you can also do some debugging. IDEs are free today. Have you seen that open source is taking everything? Then you can, the one I would advise for you to start would be Visual Studio Code. It's built by Microsoft. And the runtime itself is built on Node. It's a, a, uh, some kind of superset of Node that is called Electron that lets you create applications for the desktop. And as Node runs on all operating systems, Visual Studio Code with Electron will run on all operating systems. And when I go on my Mac, when I go on my Windows machine, I have the same Visual Studio Code, and I can do exactly the same thing on Linux. And you go to Visual Studio Code, you download the tool, and by default, it will uh, run uh, JavaScript development environment. You will have it by default. If you do Python, Go, Java, other languages, it has extensions. You can load those extensions. Then personally, I'm writing 
Python too, and I write it from Visual Studio Code. It's my universal development environment. Then you get there, you download it, you install it. And let's do a tour of what you can create there. Then here, I have downloaded, uh, remember, JavaScripting? That's what I downloaded with all the examples and solutions of the exercises. Then let me start with the very first one. This is how you say console, you log hello. Okay, this is every, everybody starts like that when you have a new programming language. And if I click uh, F5, now you see I am running a debugger and I see the results right away in my ID. If I change it to see robot, hello robot, and I can save my file, I can run it again and debug it, and I will go with robot. All good? Then now you can, what can you do in JavaScript? You can loop. Then here is an example. You've got an array with three objects in there. Then you want to create a loop and show the different components. Pretty easy syntax. Every language looks the same. Nothing different. The nice thing now that you have an IDE, like Visual Studio Code, is that you can put a breakpoint in there. And that's the best way to learn to me. I never write some code from scratch. I copy an example, and I put a breakpoint in there, and I see what's going on there. And that's a, that's a good way to start. Then Visual Studio Code, you will run your code, and it will say, hey, I'm breaking. And you will be able to see the current value for E is 0. And if you highlight uh, this whole piece here, uh, you will get this is the contents. And you'll be able to scroll through them. You can also go on the line here and say, what can I do with pets? And you can start editing some code, like pets dot, uh, can I length? And that will be the length of my array. And here I'm tapping JavaScript. And I am interacting live. See? That's something important. JavaScript does not compile. It's a script. You change something, you run it straight away. You import some code, you run it straight away. If it's broken, it breaks straight away. <laughs> okay. Let's break it, for example. Let's say you, you remove something here, like that. You save it. Okay. The, uh, the development environment will help you, saying, hey, there's an issue here. And if you try to run it, it will say, sorry, my friend, uh, I can't run that. I have an exception here. Okay, then easy. You save your file, you run it. Uh, I've put another idea here. It's the idea of a function. Then this one, it's filtering. Then your array. This is the name of the array. You want to filter it. And how do you filter it? With an independent function. And you give the function here. The function takes only the odd numbers. Then every time it goes through a number, it takes the old one and returns it to build a new array. And again, if you run it, you will get, uh, as a result, no surprise. Oh, I can continue. You can do breakpoints. And up, I will remove my breakpoints. I continue. And this is a new array you get. Only the old numbers. Make sense? The last one I wanted to show you, it's the object. Then this one, see, I've got an object. An object can contain an array. No reason. An object can contain another object. And then you say, I want to see what's a pizza object and what's a variable of the pizza. What is the value of that element? And this is the way you go into your elements. And then I created something interesting. You can also add some more elements. Like you say, pizza. Pizza.size equals Excel, because I love pizzas. I can put a breakpoint here. And I, I will say, now that will add. Now my pizza objects here, for now it has only 
one, two, three attributes. On the next line, I'm going to add an extra attribute to my object. Then I do next step. And if I show pizza again, here's my object. And see now, it has the same attributes plus the size. I just added. And it's a dynamic language. You create your scripts, but when it runs, you can add some extra stuff to it. I said it's a very simple language, but that can make it tricky sometimes. Because you can't see in the code, you say, hey, where, where is that attribute coming from? But maybe it was added from something else. There's no type checking. There's no security with JavaScript. Everything is just dynamic, OK? Which means that you will need, and sorry, I moved the mic. It means you will need um, um, a debugger to understand what's going on in real time. That's the best way to do it. And do what I did just on the command line. The last thing I wanted to show you is that you can also add another attribute. Here, I'm, I've added another attribute. But that attribute now, it's not a property. It's not a value. It, it's a function itself. It's a very open language. Then now if you call pizza.showDetails, and that's a function, now I'm calling the function. And I'm executing the function. Then when I call it, let me put a breakpoint here. And I'll continue my code. Now I've hit that part. It went up here. And I'm eating that, I'm eating that function. And this part says, hey, I am a pizza with toppings. And here, I'm putting the value. This is a way to do concatenation. Here, I'm building, a, this is a string template. And I am putting the value of my object pizza. I'm taking the attribute, and I put it in the string and return. If you, if you understood all this, you should be in good position to start doing your first code with JavaScript. Uh, everything clear so far? We should continue now, going with more uh, crazy code. Then, not cool, you will find a lot of examples. Just pick the, the one you like. If you want to learn Electron, pick the Electron course. If you want to learn Git, you can learn Git. If you want to learn how to push your uh, project on NPM, go to the NPM module. Very easy, good start. You will also find a lot of resources on the internet. And you can create games, a lot of crazy stuff. And uh, then I just put some examples here. Personally, I work a lot, when I work on the back end, I often need to create a simple HTTP server just to give an answer. Then this is the way you would create an HTTP server. You will give it, you will say, you will create a server from HTTP objects, and then you will say, hey, server, listen to a port. And then when something happens, when you receive, and this is where you get your request response, you will answer to the flow with a status code. And in those lines on JavaScript, you're already creating an HTTP server, responding the value you need. Very easy. And again, you, do, you install Node. And you run your script right away. No need to compile runs everywhere. Windows, Linux, Mac. You've got an HTTP server running. What I do a lot at Cisco, I do a lot of WebEx. And when you do WebEx, I love building bots. And what is a bot? Are you, do you use WebEx teams a bit? The client? Then you can chat in there. A bot is exactly the same experience, but it's a machine responding. How does that work? Basically, your bot has registered to the WebEx Cloud platform. And when someone is calling, is speaking in a space, the message gets, um, is passed to the bot, to your code, on HTTP. And now, remember this HTTP server, it can receive a message from WebEx. Exactly the same code I showed you. And then, you see what's in the message, like hello robot, and you answer. You push a message back. 
And that comes to the space. And that's the way you build a bot. Two things to do, receive messages, send messages back. And that's what a bot does. It keeps speaking in space. Then I created a small one, then exactly the same code I showed. You create your server, server.listen. Second thing, you will add, uh, I also add, a, you will, we don't need to see that part in detail, it's an elf check. It's just the root of my server so that I can always ping it and check it's alive. It's always something I do. You don't need that for the bot. What you need is the post is where uh, WebEx is going to, to call back your bot. And then here, you will, be, you will get called. You will get called with the body of your request. And the body will contain, um, see it here, it will contain your message. And then, here you'll get your message. Then in three lines of code, you'll be able to get what's coming up. Um, let me show you it. Uh, this is when you build something from scratch. Generally, you won't do that when you start doing Node. What you will do, you will pick a library, a module, that makes things easy for you. And someone already created a library to build advanced bots. This library has got more than yeah, hundreds of thousands of developers and 10,000 stars on GitHub. It's BotKit. Then every developer building bots does npm install BotKit, gets the BotKit module on his machine, and starts building a bot. And when you do that, if you go to that address, I've put it on the deck, and you click on Remix on Glitch, it will do exactly what I did before. But instead of installing your code on your machine, it installs it. Glitch is the exact equivalent of Visual Studio Code, but in the cloud. Then now you can code from the cloud. Let me show you. Then here, I'm on Glitch. It's a free, free service. You can start creating your own project. And I've, I, I have downloaded some code here. And then I can edit my code. See here, I've got a file. What does it do? We're going to check right after. For now, I can tell you this is a bot. It has a token. I've created it with Robert five minutes before uh, the session started. If I go in WebEx Teams, here is Robert. I can say, Robert, I'm, I want to give the keyword color. And now Robert is responding. What is your favorite color? And I say green. And cool. Robert bot loves green too. Then can you see that part? I have a bot responding to a message asynchronously and getting the argument from my previous responses. It goes all the way from exchanging message with the WebEx Cloud platform like I showed. It's a lot of work to do if you want to build that. Now I'm going to show you the five, the 10 lines of code. You can do it with JavaScript, with BotKit module, so that you can understand the value of the ecosystem. Then let's come back to the code. Then here is the code. See it there? Then first thing, this is JavaScript. I'm creating a module. A module is a piece that is reusable. The module, when my, and I receive an object controller, when the controller hears the word color, it will start a new function to respond. And the function will start a conversation and say, this is BotKit. Ask, what is your favorite color? Hey, when the answer gets here, again, it's a function. It's asynchronous. It gets called when I get the answer from the user. I say, cool, I like the response. Then now we can change it live. We can say, this is Cisco Live Europe. And what is your favorite language? Like it? 
Um, now I should be able to go back to WebEx Teams. The glitch environment restarts every time you make a change. It restarts a new server with your code in real time with containers. You know those Docker containers? They take the code and they start a new container with the code in there and they put it live. And they route all the message back to this new code in real time. That's impressive. I love Glitch. Then my bot is live. Now if I type color again, it will say, hey, this is Cisco Live Europe. What is your favorite language? And I will say JavaScript, of course. And see, the bot is not very smart. And he says, hey, he, he likes JavaScript, of course, too. He just took the string. Works for you? Then see, creating a bot with conversations, threads, everything can be very complicated. It can take three years from an engineer to understand all those pieces. If you pick the right module in the JavaScript community, you have to look for the best module. Generally, you go to GitHub. You look for a module with a lot of stars. It means there's a lot of users. And you see the example. You try to make the example work on your machine from the tutorial. And when it works, you start changing it. That's the best way of starting learning. And the easy way is to find easy resources to start. Then that's what we do at DevNet. We love creating easy starting points for you so that you can start easy with Cisco APIs. And then, guys, you do much better than us, OK? You're doing your job. You have your own business. Then you're using the APIs for your own needs, OK? You would do more advanced code than us. But then you can put it back to the community to code exchange. And uh, I will speak about code exchange a bit later, OK? It's a place where you can share code all together and share with the community any code using Cisco APIs. That's a good way to publish it. Then. That's the example of skill I just showed. You can also create command lines, like I showed earlier, like JavaScripting. You npm install something. Then this is the example of a command line for WebEx that helps you use the latest guest issuer feature. Then just go through the code if you're interested. You'll see it's very simple code. It uses a module named Commander. Then like I showed BotKit for bots. Commander is a good module to create command lines tools. The next thing is you can also extend devices with JavaScript. Then that's what we're doing at WebEx with WebEx devices. Then WebEx devices, every device from Cisco Collaboration that runs Cisco Collaboration Endpoint Software, CE, which means everything except WebEx boards for now, will is coming with a JavaScript runtime and can run JavaScript. What can you do with that? You can do crazy things. You can create your own code and activities. Then here, I've got a touch 10 connected to that room kit. And I have some specific code I have added. And I have a, <clears throat> a workshop this afternoon at 4, when in 45 minutes, you will go end zones, workshop 4, and you will learn to build that. It's a panel. When you press a button, it pushes a message to WebEx Teams. And this is like 80 lines of JavaScript. And you build the panel. That's what we will do. You add an ID to the button. This is no JavaScript here. It's just building an interface. And then you, we are going to put the code on the codec. That's what we call a macro. For that, we use the macro environment that comes with your codec. And that is where your code goes. And in there, see, you will say, hey, when, when an event is happening on one of your objects, you will get the ID, and you will run your JavaScript code. With that, I've got an example where you say, hey, this is my own panel here. And I said, I want to switch on the lights in my room, OK? I want to turn it green. I want to turn it blue. To do that, it's exactly 10 lines of JavaScript. You get the message, and you send it. Uh, we don't have a lot of time. 
I will, you, you'll just go through the slides so that you can get the code, or you can go to the session. And basically, this will be the code you will need. Then, again, 10 lines of code, and you are, you are able to build pretty impressive apps just by using connecting stuff together, and that's what JavaScript is for. Easily connecting existing components. Then, there's one thing that is important I mentioned at the beginning is JavaScript is asynchronous. Every time you ask for a data, it comes back to the main loop because, okay, node has only one single thread of execution. Then if I'm asking, if I'm sending a message to the lamp, I'm waiting for the answer by default. That means my whole app is blocking now. You can't accept that. To avoid that, they created a model, and when you ask for something external to your code, it gets to a queue and wait for the response, but your queue continues executing. And that's the reason why later you add a function to get a callback when you get the response. Then this is what asynchronous means. Which means that every time you will create, for example here, I'm going on the internet, I'm requesting a content, and the response won't come in real time, when it will come back, I will run that function. But that will happen later, when it will come back. And that's a callback. Call request, when the function comes back, go to the callback and see what happens. Has there been an error, has there been a result? It's not like Python, where everything goes one way to another, because in other languages, Java, C Sharp, Python, you've got single, several threads of executions. Then your code, you can read it, it executes there. In JavaScript, it executes, if it finds something, it needs I.O., it will go to the next line and, and your function will get executed later. Then this is what you need to grab your end around. Then I've put a few examples. Just know that when you need to do that, come to my examples, that's the best way to do it. Then that's a callback. There's another way of doing it. There's a lot of libraries. This one is a way to do it with what we call premises. You'll see a lot of talk about premises. It's just another syntax. Then now I do the same thing, get, but instead of putting a function, a callback at the end, now I'm doing then. And then when I get the answer, I execute the next part. And that is a function, taking a response, and then I log the response. And it's exactly the same, but another way of writing your code. Still asynchronous, but it's easier to read for some people. That comes with a JavaScript version 6. With JavaScript version 8, they've even taken it up it a step further to make it more simple. Then now, you have this new command called await. See it here? Await. And it will wait for you asynchronously, create the code behind the scene. It's like exactly the same. It will generate this code dynamically. And then you will go to the next line when you get the return. No need to write a new function again. It's just different ways of writing the same and dealing with asynchronicity. Did you get it? That was very important. I wanted to spend five minutes there. And the, the last part for JavaScript, you have to understand, is the versions of JavaScript. If you've been to JavaScript five years ago, it was a mess. Or 10 years ago, it was a mess. Because JavaScript was so popular, everybody was taking JavaScript and adding some stuff to it, because it's very extensible. Then in December 2009, we managed to put everybody on the same line with a standard called ECMAScript. It is a standard version of JavaScript. It's a specification. ECMAScript 5 was like, this is the standard way of doing JavaScript for everybody now, for all run times to support. And then they said, we will go, all the extra features, we will specify them and it will come to the version 6 of JavaScript. And it took them six years to agree on what would be in the standard version of JavaScript. Six years, there was so many stuff. And then everybody moved to JavaScript 6. And then, then that took six years, and now every year we've got new versions. Then it's the right moment, what I'm saying, it, it's the right moment to start doing JavaScript. 
because now the mess is tidied <laughs> and you've got regular version, not a lot coming up and everything has standardized. Then if you tried it in the past, it should be much easier now. If you need to start, start with JavaScript 6. That's a good way because that's the latest and everybody's getting there. You may find some old code existing, but it's perfectly compatible, always. Then you don't need to change your code version. ECMAScript 7 will run all previous versions, a very good backward compatibility. JavaScript never breaks. And this is the functions you will find on the way. You can take some time when you're home to look at the slides and come back and see, hey, what do you want to use? And generally, each node version, each long-term support, it's only the odd version. Number six, number eight, number 10, number 12. This is the long-term versions. They come supporting uh, the new version of ECMAScript, JavaScript. And then just pick the latest, you'll be good because it will run all previous versions. Easy. You go, you pick, today you would pick node 10 and you will run everything in the universe about JavaScript because it has backward compatibility and can go with the latest features. If you want to go in the details, because there's a lot of features, there's a lot of compatibility if you want to run the latest, but you don't need to start with that. Just start with the easiest. I just showed you that as a reference. I have three more minutes to cover client-side JavaScript. In fact, once you've understood JavaScript, the language basics, you can run it here on your computer. You've understood the versioning. Well, now you're good. You can create any JavaScript code. And it's exactly the same running in the browser. Then, what do you need to know? JavaScript in the browser, why would you do that? It's to create an app that, did, that is dynamic. Let me give you just a bit of history. In the past, we, then uh, an app is HTML, CSS for the styling, and JavaScript for the dynamic part. If you click a button, if you want an event, if you have a mouse moving, all those events are catched by JavaScript and they can make something happen, like change the contents. Then typically, we used to do it with a lot with jQuery up to five or 10 years ago. Now we tend to do single page applications. You know, you are on the dashboard and you click and the page doesn't refresh. Everything stays from the same page, which means it's a lot of JavaScript behind the scene. Because every time you click somewhere, some code comes, change the contents of the actual contents of the page and make it happen and get requests the internet dynamically. That's a lot of code. To build that, the community has been investing a lot on Angular. And if you need to build a single page application, something rich, you will want to go with one of those languages, modules, extra flavors of JavaScript. If you want to do sim something simple, I click a button, I get an answer, go with jQuery, that's enough. And, and that's it. Uh, then, um, a bit about single page applications. It's about having a single page and different views. And to do that, all of them, they've created a way of creating components. And that's what you will see, whether we, you do Vue, React, or Angular, at the end of the day, you will create a component with a very clear distinction of the UI and the behavior. Then the UI, you will get it, and the behavior will be different pieces of your same components. That was an example with Vue, you'll get it in the deck. That's an example with React. React is used a lot at Cisco. Most of dashboards you see when you've got uh, a networking device with a dashboard you can administer or, or a cloud service like WebEx Control Hub. And others, they all use a lot of single page application, React, Angular. This is about re React. Then, see the syntax. This is HTML. Inside you have JavaScript. And this is a dynamic part with two parts. One is the uh, HTML, and one is the, where you want to insert it. And that part here, it's JavaScript being interpreted. And it's pretty tricky to, under, to understand because it's not looking like JavaScript and everything I showed you before. It's a specific language called GSX 
that is compute, compiled and generates JavaScript at the end to make your page dynamic. Then that, I wouldn't suggest you to start with that. Start JavaScript with server side. When you're ready, go with jQuery on the client side. And when you need to do something more advanced, go with React. And you will be able to create very, like a card like that. In two lines, two com one component, you'll say, I want to create a card component. See it here? I create my HTML part. I insert it in my HTML page. Then now I have inserted in my HTML a card. And the card is composed of two other elements, a square and a label. I initialize it with a property. The property gets passed. And now my square and label, they display, they have their own objects, and they display the property. When you create a single page application, you create lots of components. And when you see something like the uh, WebEx Teams and all, all these components, it's like hundreds of components being assembled together. And that's a way assembled with JavaScript in the back end. Then that's a lot on these parts. You will pre-compile them. You will take care of the different versions of JavaScript with Babel. Because not everybody has the, version of, has the same version of JavaScript on his machine. You've got Chrome, you've got Firefox, you've got Internet Explorer, maybe, with different versions, which means different runtimes of JavaScript, with different capabilities. Then behind the scene, remember, JavaScript is backward compatible. Then Babel is a tool that takes your version of JavaScript 6, for example, and turns it back to JavaScript 5. So that when you publish your application, everybody which receives JavaScript 5. And you're good to go. All that happens behind the scene with Babel, which is a famous module you will eat if you go to the, so, uh, to the client side part of JavaScript. Then, and we're good to go. Uh, if you want to go further, there are three st extra stuff. And I'm sorry, we are out of time then you will want to use a linter to check your syntax. You can type TypeScript to type your JavaScript. Then it's an extension from Microsoft has been pushing, and it's getting universal. And the last part is GraphQL, which is an advanced language to query, uh, to query your APIs. Um, to wrap it up, JavaScript is ubiquitous. You can find it everywhere. There's a lot of different flavors and runtimes for it. And if you want to move further, we've got a learning track at Cisco and start. It also explains you how to install Visual Studio Code on your machine and to do your first debugging steps. Okay? And the Learning Lab station is over there. And we've got a Start Now zone if you want to start making your first steps today during Cisco Live Europe. Thank you very much. Don't forget to rate the station. Say it if you like it, if you want more. Also say it. I will be happy to rate uh, and to read all your contents and comments. And uh, you're finished for today. Thank you very much. I can take some more questions. <laughs>